Fifteen years ago, when Neil Wainwright was starting his company, Nexonia, no one even knew the term SaaS. Ten years ago, when Kim Kaplan joined Plenty of Fish, as their third employee, the first non-support hire, not only was online dating a niche and surreptitious world, but mo mobile was not even a thing. So a lot has changed since then. And uh, not only consumer behaviors, not only how do you start and build a company, but the entire unknown of scaling a business into a high-impact company. So um, it's, it's a lot of hard work. And we're here to talk about the trials and tribulations. We've come a long way. So I'd like to start for you two to do a quick introduction as to what brought you here. And then uh, I'm going to fire a lot of quick questions at you. Kim. Um, I got asked to come. <laughs> but um, realistically, my biggest passion right now is trying to give back to the Vancouver community and try to help more and more people become successful in creating bigger startups, um, more successes coming out of here so that can breed more and more successes. So my biggest passion right now is trying to help as many startups as possible that I can do with current bandwidth and enjoying temporary retirement um, while still trying to move other companies forward. Uh, I offered to come here um, uh, from Toronto. I did Tech Toronto a couple years ago. I had a great time. It was very rewarding for me. Um, I'm at a stage in my career when I'm giving back to the community a lot. So I, I spend time with a lot of startups. I advise them on product, market fit. I just look at their tech. I'm a software engineer. This means I'm an engineer. And um, I just like helping other people and want to see everybody be successful. So that's why I'm here. All right. Well, we're really thrilled. It's a privilege to have these two esteemed tech leaders in this room tonight. So I'd like to start with a quick audience survey. So raise your hand if um, you founded or you're working at a company that is less than or not yet at one million in annual revenue. Great. Um, now raise your hand if you're at a company that is larger than that. All right, interesting breakup. How about if you're a manager in your role at your company? And for those who are builders, so you could be a builder or a manager, but if you're a builder. All right, great. So we have a, a real mix of things. And I think there's a clear distinction here. So there's a critical disclaimer to this talk, is that nearly everything that happens in a company before you have proven your product market fit or your value proposition, it's completely different from after. Um, now, you would not want to pour, fire on, uh, pour gas on the fire before you have proven that, um, before you attempt to scale up the company, before you have product market fit. So we're going to talk quickly about product market fit and what it means to have achieved that, to have learned that, um, what you have at, in that process. But then we're going to dive a lot deeper into all the pains of all those elements when you're growing a company, scaling a company up, and, and what happens there. What are the important and non-important levers to pull? How do you figure it all out, and how do you cope? So, um, Kim. I'd love to hear like uh, maybe the scale of uh, Plenty of Fish maybe at the start and at the end of your time there. So like the number of users, where ge geographically it's most prominent, and like how many relationships and babies it's made. <laughs> Can I answer some of those? Um, uh, when I started, we were at 15 million users. Um, and when I left a couple months ago, we were at over 150 million. Um, we are, we were the largest dating site in the world until Tinder came along. Uh, so we were number one in US, Canada, UK, Australia, and Brazil. Um, and we do have some presence in Europe as well. Um, Tinder came along and took the number one spot from us, but uh, they're all part of the match group. So I say they're kind of like a sibling in that you want to uh, compete with them, but at the same time help them out. Uh, so we're still pretty competitive. Um, if you really think about product market fit, um, the biggest thing for me is you have to understand with your customers if you're adding value. Are they getting value out of the product? 
with a plenty of fish, the value really came from us helping people meet. And if we allowed someone to meet or they met on our platform, they were our biggest advocates. So if you are really offering value, in the, but then they leave our site. So it's kind of a catch-22. Um, but if you're really offering value to your customers, they will go out and be your biggest advocate for you. And you really want to understand, as you're getting those first few customers, how do they feel about your product? What value are you adding to them? Is it just lip service? Are you just kind of trying to sell to people and they aren't actually getting anything from you? And you're trying to hide from them the fact that you aren't actually delivering any value. So really try to understand how much value those customers get from you because they will go out there and they'll shout from the rooftops. If you are adding value, they'll tell everyone. So when you started with 15 million users, um, 15, 15 um, at that time, did you feel like, oh, it's too late, you know, we've, it's already made it, or could you have foreseen the potential scale that could have gone from there? I didn't even know what Plenty of Fish was. Um, I met Marcus, the founder, drunk over a bottle of wine, uh, and he offered me a job the next day. I waited till I was past my probationary period to ask him why, um, and... Uh, to me, it was just this opportunity to kind of be a part of something. Um, I think it was great to know that we were adding value to people's lives. It was beyond just a tech company. It was beyond just um, making money. It was, we were really helping people meet. We were helping people, we say, meet, marry, and make babies, going back to your point. But uh, there was no moment where I said, this is a rocket ship, I must jump on. It was, you kind of, I joined and you were doing everything. I, I was doing our legal because I was the person who was most qualified because I had a business degree. Um, probably the wrong move, but it was, uh, you just kind of did whatever you needed to do to help the company grow. You grabbed on to whatever it is, like you were, there was three of us. You just kind of did it. Um, there was no questions, there was no asking. It was just you took on whatever you could to help make this thing a success. Great. Uh, Neil, now tell us about the scale. Uh, so you've got two great companies we can talk about tonight. There's UpHabit, your new company, but Nexonia was a company you started in 2002, 2000, around yeah, then? it's 2002. So could you give, give us a sense of uh, the scale you achieved, the number of corporate accounts you had, recognizable names you had. Yeah, uh, before I do that, I've never snowboarded. I, I, go, I, go, I go hella skiing, and I've never rapped in my life. So I don't know where some of those stats came from, but that's Two truths and a lie. Um, yeah, that would be really good. Um, so uh, Nexani was a, an expense management platform. If you guys have heard of uh, Expensify or Concur, I beat them every single day. Uh, Concur would compete with me only on price, even though they're the big elephant in the room because they couldn't beat me any other way. Um, Expensify sued me uh, about four years ago for a trademark violation, uh, which is uh, you know an interesting thing to sue about um, because we just kept beating them all the time and it was really getting under their skin. Um, the, um, we got to about 2,000 corporate accounts. So if you're in B2B, that's a lot of customers. Um, Splunk, CrossFit. CrossFit, the only ones who could beat me up. I really was scared of them, but they're really nice people, so it was good. Uh, Marketo, um, Kustard in Canada. I don't know. I, I just keep forgetting all the company names, which is actually why I started Up Habit, because it's all about helping you not forget those company names. Um, but um, we got to be about 2,000 corporate accounts. We're growing. We're doubling every year for five years. So I did the, actually, what's just funny about it is when you talk about the business perspective, I sucked at the business perspective because I didn't realize five years later I had done a hockey hockey stick. You know, those ones that you always do when you're pitching investors. I look back historically, once I sold the business and I had actually done a hockey stick, the slope of the curve kept increasing. Um, and I didn't know it at the time because when you're doubling every year, which Kim can attest to, or more than doubling every year, you're kind of going nuts. Um, I have a lot of gray hair, Noah does. I don't understand why Kim doesn't have any gray hair. Um, it is a, is a chaotic environment if you get into those scaling and growth uh, challenges. And um, one message I can say is you're going to screw up a lot. You just try and do a lot, do some a little bit better than you screw up and you're, you're winning. So, but it was about 2,000 corporate accounts. I, I, just to add to that, I think one of the reasons why we didn't also look at that massive trajectory you're hitting is because we focused on two or three metrics. And you just look at how do you improve those two or three metrics a little bit every week. And that was all we cared about. And if you're only looking at those two or three metrics and your improvements are 5%, 10%, it adds up over time. But on a week-to-week -week basis, you don't see those doubling. You don't see that tripling of the business. And so all of a sudden, it kind of hits you when you look back and you're like, wow, we really made a difference in this last year. But it's not that exponential jump at any point in time. Oh, yeah, and I won Slack as a customer just before I left. <laughs> Forgot that one. It's <laughs> a good one. Uh, so. 
we're going to talk about product market fit just a little bit, just to set that, and then we're going to move on to the, the high scale, high impact kind of stuff. But I want to talk about, OK, imagine um, the difference between starting Nexonia and, up, and UpHabit, and the difference between when you were starting at Plenty of Fish and the companies that you're advising now, working with early stage companies now. How would you, what would you say is the best signal that your company has a moat or has a value proposition that's resonating, that you have that product market fit and you're ready to turn, turn the corner and focus on completely different things? If people stick around and they want to keep paying you. Uh, you know, it's nothing like having paying customers. Um, up habits two weeks away from launch, so we have no paying customers. Uh, but we have a lot of beta users that are sticking with us. Uh, Nexonia was the same way. I, when I sold the private equity in 2016, it started in 2015, uh, they came and they did some due diligence on us, and they said, we want to know what your churn rate is, right, which is how many customers you're losing uh, versus gaining. And um, what they found out is we had a, I didn't even know the number, we had a negative 30% churn. So we lost, two, I think, 2 or 3% of the customers per year, and we, our existing customers grew by 33% a year. So we had a negative, uh, and they found out that no customer under a thousand, over $1,000 in MRR at sales opportunity had we lost in the prior 12 months. And they just were shocked, and I didn't actually know these numbers, but that's, they didn't find them. Um, but it was because we had really good product, we had really good uh, customer support, and they just stuck with us through, through a lot. And um, they just, you know, they were willing to pay, and. And our longest term customers, um, even Splunk was one of my customers, and if you know them, they're kind of big now, but I got them when they were 20 people using QuickBooks for Mac. And um, they came in, and a new, a new director of finance came in and said, we're gonna put all our you know, relationships out to tender. And she said, Neil, you're one of those companies. And then about a, two weeks later, she called me up and said, Neil, I found out that you're the only company we're never putting out to tender. Um, because we've done such a good job on the product and the users and the support that we gave them that there's no chance from the CEO on down they ever wanted to switch. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, Kim, and now you're working with some great companies, advising different companies. So can you comment on that about how you're seeing that difference of determining when you've reached that signal? I think the biggest thing is looking at different cohorts. So if you look at people that signed up in January and what their retention is, people that signed up in February, what their retention is, and as you change your product, monitoring it to see if retention changes. Um, because if your new user growth, you might be having exponential new user growth, but you could be losing more and more people over time. And that's the most important thing. As long as your net in is greater than your net out, then you've at least got something there. And you can fix the components. You can fix your churn rate. You can focus on it, but you need to know what those numbers are in order to be able to focus on them and say, okay, this is something we need to improve or it's fine, we don't need to touch it right now. Yeah, I echo both those things. Uh, cohort analysis is really critical and compound interest, if it's in your favor, is gonna cause you to win in the long run. All right, we're turning a page here. Now we've got that product market fit. Now we are in the scaling uh, period of the company. Now we know that it works and we just have to figure out how we're gonna scale up process and sales and marketing. So um, between the two of you, I'd love to hear maybe um, Neil from the side of building up a repeatable and scalable sales model, uh, and Kim about how do you build a growth engine that, that works, that's experimental, and that where failure is accepted. So Neil, you wanna start that off? Well, um, I like to say that we kind of sucked at marketing and we're okay at sales, yet we doubled every year. Um, so I don't know that I actually, you know, I, I saw someone who'd built, um, a really great sales and marketing process for B2B, and it was awesome. And I sat in the audience like you guys are, and I was just kind of blown away and depressed because I'd spent nine months trying to make ours better, and I still thought we sucked at it. And then at the end of the talk, I got to go talk to this gentleman and ask, well, how did you get to this awesome process? Oh, he says, Neil, it sucked for about 16 months, and then 18 months it got better. And I was like, oh, good, I'm only nine months into it, so I should still be sucking. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, we, you, know, you know, we didn't actually have outbound salespeople. For those of you in B2B, we just had deals coming to us all the time. I built a very big partner network. For those of you that want to build partner networks, I can talk to you a lot about it. Those partners drove deals to us. They would call us up and say, hey, we've got four new customers for you. Just do the paperwork and sign them up and get them implemented quick because we, we sold them for you. Um, I did a lot of that. I did a lot of integrations with third-party systems, and they drove business to us. So we didn't actually have to do a lot of outbound sales and a lot of outbound marketing. We just had people calling us, coming, at, coming to our booths at trade show and standing 10 deep and wanting to do business with us. So that's how we got to scale and start to, got to grow that quickly. Kim, growth? 
if you aren't failing, you aren't thinking big enough. Um, if you really want to grow your business, especially talking to a number of people in the room that are under a million in MRR, or sorry, AR, um, you're, you need those big steps. You can't be thinking about 5%, 10%, and these little things here and there. Think about how you're going to double the business, how you're going to triple the business, and you need to take some risks. They might be calculated. You might look at what is the competition doing? How can I potentially try something that they're working on? We did that all the time. We watched our competition like hawks. And it was really trying to figure out how can we take calculated risks and double down on this feature or that feature while still maintaining the rest of the business. So you have to fail in order to try. How often do you think you're failing? A lot. 30%? Um, oh, way more 50%? than 50%? I mean, we've run hundreds of split tests, and maybe 50% of them would work, maybe. Um, but each of them teaches you something that then allows you to get better at that next test and gets you better at trying to optimize for whatever funnel you're trying to do. But so how do you to fail. How do you motivate a team when they're seeing failure all the time where maybe it's acceptable to you, but uh, they're concerned? It's how do you learn from it? If you test different packages, you test different pricing, what does that teach you? Did you move too many people to a shorter package? Okay, well, that's unacceptable. How do you get more people to the longer package or the higher package price? Um, it's really about what can you take away from those learnings that are from those experiments that'll allow you to say, okay, this is the next move I'm gonna make. You know, at UpHabit, uh, one of our Slack channels is mistakes. And everybody logs their mistakes and I always give this, the thumbs up to whatever they've said about mistakes. Uh, and part of our core um, you know, values is that uh, one of our things is make new mistakes. That's literally what we call it. And it's part of our passion. And I tell people if they're not making mistakes, they're not trying hard enough. And they need to have a space where they can make those mistakes and they're gonna feel comfortable that me as the founder is not gonna you know, be upset with that. And I'm actually celebrating them. Because it's one of the only ways you're going to move forward is if you're all making mistakes and screwing up and trying new things and experimenting. Because everybody out there who's competing with you is at least as good as you, so you want to be better than them. And the only way you can do that is by stretching. Neil, before uh, this, just over there, we were talking about Adam Grant. And uh, so how do you foster a, uh, a culture or a workplace where you can share your mistakes, you can ask for help, which is a big Adam Grant sort of concept? How do you, how do you foster that? Um, well, it was, I was very fortunate with UpHabit um, in that I decided to define the culture and the values and then I hired my first employee. So literally I set all the values, I set the, I set the culture, and then I hired people so they had to believe in it before. Now, but when, I, when we tell people in recruiting that we, we want them to make mistakes and we encourage it and we're supportive of it, like everybody just wants to join the company because of that. Because so many times they've been dumped on in their career because they tried something new and they made a mistake and their manager jumped on them. Um, and they know that they, they realize that when they join us that we want them to learn we want them to be continually learning We put a lot of effort into that and we also want them to be making mistakes And they don't have they have the freedom to experiment and try new things So it started at the beginning I defined the culture and the values before I hired my first employee and that's after Eight you know, it's my eighth startup and I'm 56 now, so I don't expect you've all done that But it's a good thing to do Neil do you remember uh, one of your posts in mistakes? One of your posts in mistakes. Do you want to share that? Oh, uh, no, there's just a whole bunch of them. I mean, I'm also 56, so I forget everything, right? Um, that's the good thing about having a boss like me. I forget everything. So, um, no, I just, you know, I, I forget to follow up with people. I forget to post a bug I found. I you know, like everything. I, every day, I'm making mistakes. So, Kim, how about a, a space for, um, for making mistakes and for asking for help? How, how do you see that? I think it's really, it's a difficult thing to foster. It really is, especially in a larger organization. Um, people want, it's more about having collaboration with your teams. And if you're collaborating and you're sharing what you're learning, then people are gonna be aware that mistakes are, and it's not mistakes, it's, to me it's not a, it's not a mistake to try something and fail at it. It's, you tried it, you failed, what did you learn from it? And as long as you're learning something and you're not making the same mistake twice, who cares? It doesn't really matter. It's not a, it's not a mistake. Um, I think my motto or mantra is always, you're going to do five or six things a year that really matter, and the rest of the stuff is going to be these trial and error things. So if you focus on the fact that you only need to do five or six things well throughout the year, 
Um, you're going to try 20 things or 30 things and you're going to hit one of those things and that's going to be what helps you take your business to the next level. All right, it's important to keep the main thing the main thing. That's a famous thing that Jim Barksdale likes to say. Um, so about focus, what are the unnecessary things? Politics, bureaucracy, um, any process that you think suck. Um, conferences, speaking conferences, engagements. Spe you know, speaking engagements are fun. <laughs> this is our chance to give back. Um, you know, anything that doesn't really advance, move the company forward, it's to Kim's point. You're making, if you're making 1% positive changes per day, that's at least 200%, 365 if you're a startup, uh, worth of improvement over the year, and then you compound it, it's even more. Okay, let's, let's talk about uh, some, you know, pillars of, of scaling up. So let's talk about um, leadership and management. How do you, um, how do you test or re do reviews or get feedback for your leadership and your management or for other executives in the company? I think it should just be part of your everyday conversations with your own reports that you have. Um, we did 360 reviews throughout the company as well, but it should just be part of the daily conversation you're having. If you're asking someone how they're doing, um, and you should be asking, how can I improve? How can I help you? What can I do better? What feedback do you have from me? It shouldn't be a one-way conversation from you to them. Yeah, we, we did, uh, I guess, employee NPS uh, stuff in my last company. Um, I just got asked about annual reviews a week ago, and I'm like, oh, crap, I got to do them. And everybody reports to me, so I got to do them all. Um, but to Kim's point, you should just, you should be really in touch with the people working with them. They should know how much you care about them. It's, it's, the leadership serves the employees, not the other way around. That's my opinion of, of what a great company is all about. Um, so you, you, there should be no surprises in your conversations with them. You should really know how they're doing on a, on a professional level, on a personal level. And, and you should make, always be working to make sure they're well supported. Um, because whatever your brain capacity is, theirs combined is far greater than yours and you have to make sure they're, they're well supported and effective and, and, and move, moving forward on the right things. So to move fast, you're gonna have to build process. You're gonna have to build process around hiring, around you're gonna have to sales. tear down the process. What's that? You're gonna have to tear down the process. Yeah, so when, when do you tear down the process? When do you change the process? When do you review that and move on and do it very differently? Uh, every every odd month, <laughs> um, you know, I was doubling every year. So every process would maybe last six months, you know, sometimes three months, but n never more than six months before I'd have to tear something down. It was a con constant change. I used to call it the uh, Nexonia time warp with my last business, where all of a sudden three months would pass and people had got two years of experience because things were moving so fast. It wasn't like we were working them to the bone or anything like this. It was just that so much changed so quickly and they had to learn so many different things in that time period that it, all of a sudden they realized they had a lot of accelerated learning that happened. But we never wanted a process to stick around if it, if it ended up becoming bureaucracy. I think anytime you add someone senior to your team, it's an opportunity for them to review and tear down your processes. Um, they've been at other companies, they've seen other things that have worked well, that haven't worked well, and you really should be t putting the task on them to say, what would you change? How would you improve this? What have you seen that's worked? And that, by far, was probably the best way in which we got feedback, and our processes adapted because new people came on board. So scaling a startup is not about building one company. It's ultimately about building companies over and over and over again. And uh, not being focused, at a certain point, you're not just building a product, you're building a, an engine for distribution. And you're building multiple products. How have you seen that uh, in, your, in your companies? <laughs> uh, really, we, like, if I think about us, we really did focus on one product. And ultimately, our product was our people. It was the people that were using the app. And as long as we made it successful for them, they met someone, they ended up in a happy relationship. It didn't matter what else we did. That was the ultimate success for us because they became our advocates. And if we stopped focusing on that, then we stopped having these success stories out there that really amplified our brand. So. I would say we really did focus on one thing and focus on doing it well. Uh, we ended up branching out into different products, but expense management was our core product. Um, and the other products came along just because uh, people kept asking us to do new things. 
those are probably not the right thing to have done, but it was the time, thing that we did back then because it was new sources of revenue. Um, you know, with UpHabit, my product is my team. If you look on my back, it says team number one. Our Habiteers, which is our end users, is number two, and our app is number three. So for me, I think the thing I'm going to be most proud of if I have a nice success with Up, Up Habit is going to be the team that I created. Um, you know, Ash mentioned Van Hack, where I brought in an international engineer uh, into Toronto to work on our team. Well, I can tell you there's five others I recruited directly myself. Sorry, Ash, wherever you are. Um, and um, I brought, I brought, I have two guys from Lebanon. I have one from Brazil, one from Dubai, and two from Russia. And I have one Canadian engineer, so I have seven engineers on the team. Um, so um, I think the thing I'm going to be most proud of once uh, UpHabit kind of runs its course and hopefully has a, a lot of success is the team I created and the, the, the people that I brought into Canada that are actually helping fuel the economy going forward. Are you seeing things that companies are waiting too long to do with their companies? Higher HR. It's, we waited too long. I think we were at 30 people before we had uh, someone in HR. And it's not just about hiring, it's about culture. And making sure that someone is ensuring that the culture that you've built is maintained. And especially as you scale, um, how do you ensure that that culture is instilled in everyone that you hire? Because it's so important to have, culture to me is the most important thing for a company. It's what makes people excited about coming to work. It's not necessarily about what you're building, it's the people you're building it with. So what happens when you have a good culture in a company? People have fun. Um, I used to say we work hard, but we play hard. Um, we'd go out drinking together. We would have different events. And people really enjoyed coming into work and having that banter with one another. Um, yes, we got down and we worked hard, but we really enjoyed the people we worked with. Um, I have some great relationships with people. We had a lot of people that had just moved to Vancouver that joined Plenty of Fish. And it was really telling when they created extremely strong relationships with one another inside the company um, and that they're still friends to this day, even if they've left. Um, so that to me is a big tell as to whether or not you've created something where people want to be friends and they want to t spend time with one another outside of the office. Yeah, I mean, creating a culture, a great culture is A, people don't leave, B, they like working there, um, C, they tell all their friends about it. it. It really helps, like, when it comes to recruiting for us, uh, every candidate now at UpHabit will meet the UpHabit team, and I know as soon as they meet them, I'm, they're going to join because, like, they're so nice, right? Um, what I had one of my... Uh, introvert, well, all engineers are introverted, so it's just so. One of my introverted engineers, which is kind of being redundant, uh, stood up in a meeting in December and said, you know, he's always worked at companies where at least there's a few assholes on the team. And he said, I cannot believe that there's no assholes here. It's so wonderful. It's so refreshing. And, um, you know, that was really powerful to me because that's what I wanted to create. Uh, it makes it so much easier for me as a leader. Um, I can come here for three days, and then I can go skiing in Utah next week until Thursday. And my company is probably going to submit to the App Store while I'm gone uh, because I have a great team. They're going to be with me for uh, hopefully a long time, and I hopefully I'm going to make them a lot of money personally and then have them contribute to the economy. But the culture is, is critical. If, if, you have a, if you try and you know, wear them down and drive them down, drive them down it'll have short-term um, positive effects, and long-term they'll all leave. Customers, Neil. What have you done when a customer was difficult for your employees? <laughs> okay, that's a fun story. So about every six months, um, my customer success team would come to me. I used to do it all, by the way, just like Kim did at, at Plenty of Fish. Um, but then we had a customer success team, and they come to us and say, Neil, you know, this customer and implementation uh, made someone cry. Literally, they make them cry on the phone because they were being so difficult uh, with my team. And they said, what do we do about it? And I you know, go to my keyboard, and I'm sitting at my desk typing, and they're saying, well, what, what should we do about it? So I'm, I'm in the middle of firing them. So if you could let me finish the email, then, you know, it'll be done. And I'd always say, we decline the opportunity to serve you. Um, any money you've paid to date will be FedEx to you and at your office tomorrow morning in a, in a check. And I would give those customers no way to say anything bad about us because I'm giving them all our money back. And they were always shocked. They always want to stick around. Uh, but the... But I, and I never relented except once when my customer success team said, uh, this person is being nice now and has been for a few months and they wanted to uh, keep that customer on. Um, but the, the impact on morale to know that I always had their back and I really didn't care about the customer if they were going to dump on my team uh, was really important for them. And, and they just felt very respected and, and cared for. How about when a customer asks for new features? Oh, here's another one for all you B2B customer, B2B developers that are having customers that are asking for new features. Um, 
I would never charge, I, I once I did, but I never charged customers for new features. If they asked, I had Splunk, they were on QuickBooks for Mac, I think I mentioned. We did a little CSV or IIF import file in QuickBooks. And they said, well, Neil, we're going, to, we're going to this thing called NetSuite. And, um, and we want to stick with you guys, but you don't integrate with NetSuite. Is there any chance we, you know, we can pay you to integrate with NetSuite? And I'm busily Googling what the hell's NetSuite and what the hell, you know, do they have an API? And my CTO is my co-founder, and I'm like, oh, look, they have a web service interface. I'm, you know, I'm messaging him. I don't even know what we were using for messaging back then. Um, and, um, and I'm saying to the customer, I'm saying, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll just do it. You know, and they're like, well, how much can we pay you? We're, we're about to go public and all this stuff. And I'm like, or that was a bit earlier than that, but um, we got all this money. And I'm thinking, nothing. I never, I only once charged the customer for adding new features. And um, I regretted it. And I, I gave them a low price, but then I regretted it, told them they had to pay more so I could build all their features for free. Um, if they're asking you for new features and it's going to make your product better, do it. I did the same thing with intact integration. I had someone approach us about intact integration. I said, yeah, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to build it as a generic service so other customers. I ended up with like four or 500 NetSuite customers, four or 500 intact customers, and it was just because I did these features for free. So I don't believe in charging customers for new features unless you're desperate for the cash, and you can do it, and that's just a startup thing, and you might have to do it in the short term, but I don't recommend it in the long term because you're creating a barrier between you and your customer. Kim, I'm afraid to ask or to think about what your customers wanted for features or what they what they're asking for. Um, so you were running revenue, but you were also running product at Plenty of Fish. Um, so how did you make decisions as to features and product development? We primarily looked at the data. Um, when you have millions of customers, they ask for everything. Um, and ultimately, it's great to get that input and say, okay, well, let's look at it, but you have to really say what's the data because it's the outliers you're hearing from. You're hearing from the people that are really upset or from the people that are really happy, but you're not hearing from the general public for the most part. So if you look at the numbers and you're saying, okay, well, how many people actually use this feature? Is it worth optimizing it? Is it worth fixing it and adding things to it? And when you dig down to it and you're like, oh, well, only 5% of people even use it, why would you spend the time and the energy on it? Um, for the most part, we primarily looked at the data to make decisions as to what we built um, and didn't really listen to our customers. Um, and I echo what Kim says, put a lot of analytics in your product. I never did with my last company. I got analytics coming right, left, up, short, down, every which way on my new product. And we know what people are clicking on, what they're using and everything else, and it helps inform our decisions. But that means you have to work with Segment or some of these analytics companies and get the statistics in so that you can make informed decisions. Okay, uh, let's try, uh, we'll do maybe five more minutes and then we're gonna open it up to, to audience Q&A. But let's uh, end with a bit of a rapid fire question, shall we? I'll have Kim go first and then Neil. It's sort of rapid fire for me with some questions. <laughs> um, let me think. How does someone work with you? Oh, interesting. Work well with you. Um. 20 seconds. I think I've said this to my teams, is that no doesn't mean no. No just means that you didn't present the data or the information to me in the way that I was able to digest it. Um, so if you're really passionate about it, just present it a different way. And I ultimately learned that from Marcus, who's the founder of Plenty of Fish, because he said no all the time. But if it was something that I felt strongly about, then I'd go and I'd make the effort, and I'd figure out, well, then I didn't put the data right, or I didn't show him the numbers that I'm seeing, or he, I didn't show it in the way that I would presenting to him why I believe in this so much. So it made me kind of vet all my ideas, and if I got a no, did I really want to invest the time and the energy in coming up with a different iteration of it? So I've told all my team, you might get a no, but don't take it as a no, take it as I didn't, you didn't present it in a way that it was compelling to me. Neil? What was the question again? <laughs> Is that a pass? No, no. H how does someone work with you? Um, uh, you just got to be you, you, the same thing as Kim. You got to be clear and concise about what you're looking for. Um, you have to be smart. Um, uh, someone a long time ago once said, I, I don't suffer fools well. Um, so, um, you know, it has to be clear. It has to make sense. I'm an engineer. And, um, but I really appreciate when you have a lot of passion and you have a strong belief in something. And if you can back it up with data, as Kim said, then the answer is always going to be yes. I, I rarely say no to something that makes sense. And that's what happened, by the way, with customers. You know, people say, well, you can't always say yes to customers. Well, they're giving me all the freaking greatest ideas on the planet, and they're, they're actually never wrong. I, I never had a 
weird request that wasn't wasn't right. So why wouldn't why wouldn't I do what they're telling me? Is I made a better product because of it. When you're hiring, what is a trait that you're optimizing for or seeking, and how do you uncover that? The Who interview is probably the best interview process you can do. Um, there's a book called The Who Interview, um, and essentially you go through the last three roles that someone has had, and you ask them the exact same questions. Who hired you? What did they hire you to do? And what would they say are your greatest strengths, your weaknesses, and why did you leave? And it's interesting to start to see patterns that come out over the last three jobs, and it really tells you what their biggest strengths are. And you're asking people that you're going, well, this person is going to be a reference for you, so you better tell me what your strengths and your weaknesses are, because I'm going to call them up, and I'm going to ask them what your strengths and your weaknesses are, so they can't lie. And it's a really interesting um, way to get truthful information out of candidates. Best so interview process. So hiring process, uh, with that, have you made your decision by the end of the interview? 100%. And there's people that you might have absolutely said, yep, this person's a go, and this happened a couple days ago. Um, absolutely was a go, and then after interviewing them and going through this process, you realize that there's patterns that come out that you're going, this just isn't someone that I want to work with. Hire fast, fire slow. And fire, <laughs> and, and fire again. Um, no, the, I know it's the opposite, but it's wrong. Anyway. Um, uh, the, um, the, 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 the most important thing you can do as, an, as a leader is um, make the tough decisions when you need to make the decisions about someone who no longer is a fit with the organization. Um, it has a tremendous, uh, can have a tremendous um, uh, positive impact on the team. And the toughest ones are when someone has been with you for a long time, but they just haven't scaled into the job that they currently have in front of them. And you, you have to you know, encourage them to find a new career. And um, that's the toughest decisions I make. And I've made it recently. Um, but it's uh, for the betterment of them and it's betterment for the team. Because they're in something where they're uncomfortable, uncomfortable because it's not really working out at this point. Um, and it's p impacting the rest of the team. And if you don't make those hard decisions, um, you're just not doing anybody a, a good service. So certainly hire slow, um, fire fast is part of it. Uh, but it's also those, those people that have grown up with the organization where the organization has grown up past them. And those are the tough ones to deal with. But those are the ones you have to deal with the most. Okay, Someone, um, someone yeah, recently did say that um, a negative person in an organization is 10 times the impact of a positive person. So you need 10 positive people in an organization to make up for one negative. And when you think about the impact that has on your organization as a whole, it's, it's cancerous. And it's something that you just need to cut. Yeah, again, b back to Adam Grant. I definitely recommend some of his stuff, his book, his TED Talks about givers and takers along those lines. Um, who is a CEO or a tech leader that you follow? Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> that is the founder of Plenty of Fish. Plenty of Fish. For the, so that, uh, Neil? Um, I'm a member of a, a CEO group in Toronto called PeerScale. It used to be called Ace Tech. Um, and I'm a member of a roundtable about just over probably about 15 or 16 uh, other co-founders or other founders um, and I look up to all of them so those are the guys that I actually talk to and listen to and follow what they do because they're, they're brilliant and they do a lot of great things like they all have great sales and marketing teams I didn't I, ke I keep doubling every year so I was doing something right um, but um, um, I, I, have, I don't have one person I look up to, but I, I look at that network as a group that I'm never going to leave. I got at least another $5 million out of my exit because of my relationship with those particular group of people. Uh, they always ask me for some of that money, and I never give it to them. But um, it's, it's an extra pile of money that I got because I built a network. And by the way, for those of you that are CEOs and founders, I never looked up from my business for about 13 years. And that was way too long where I wasn't looking at my network and see, talking to other people. If you can talk to other CEOs, you can talk about your experiences, you open you know, yourself to uh, telling them stories that you wouldn't ordinarily, or ordinarily tell people, you'll probably find out that they're going to go, oh yeah, I just had the same thing happen to me last week. It's a very lonely job being a CEO um, because everything flows up to you. People say it flows down, but it, no, it flows up. Um, and you need that support and that network, so you should reach out and talk to each other. Get, getting an advisory board as well early on so from some people who are either have been through your stage or are currently at your stage that can help you through some of your problems is extremely valuable. So where do you turn for advice and how do you seek advice? Well, my wife tells me what to do all the time. <laughs> um, my husband tells me what to do. Yeah. 
Um, I, I look at my uh, network at PeerScale, uh, which I know is not an organization in Toronto, um, but I just look for a, a network of peers and advise, you know, like and and build an advisory board. Um, I, I typically I've been offered now equity to be advisors, and I kind of shrink back from it because I don't necessarily I don't want equity. I think if you're an advisor's got a chunk of your company, they might be thinking about themselves more than they are you. Um, but then you're putting a lot of effort in that company, so um, I guess it's a trade-off. But um, I just I just look at my network, but, you know, of of CEOs. But that's something I've learned over the last five years. I needed to build, and if you can build that quicker, I think you're going to grow quicker. Okay. And yeah. Find, go ahead. Finding the friends that you really trust. You can have your advisory board, but find some people that you trust that you've spent time with that know you before you were in the business because they'll keep you grounded. And they're people that you can lean on in these times where the world is changing around you, but you don't need to change necessarily. Okay, last question. So what is the unexpected thing along this journey? And I guess to rephrase that, if you could tell yourself, Kim, in 2008, 2009, when you were joining this now rocket ship, or, or Neil, back in 15 years ago, uh, starting your company, what would you have told yourself back then? The surprising moment for me um, was Marcus was never going to sell the company. He was never going to sell the company. And um, we were meeting for a conference in San Francisco, and he walks into a restaurant, and we're, we'd flown in from different cities, and he sits down and he goes, I'm selling the company. And my jaw just dropped, because this is something that I'd been at the company now for seven years, and this was just... I couldn't even fathom that he's walking in and telling me this. And it took a lot of time to kind of wrap my head around the fact. And the process went so quickly. I think we sold within two, three months that you just didn't even have a time to kind of get out of that fever of, holy crap, this is actually happening. Um, but that was probably the most shocking moment for me. And, um, and a great experience and learning experience going through acquisition. Um, we went public as part of the acquisition. Uh, we didn't have budgeting or forecasting. We were a solo run company. There's no investors, so we just kind of did what we wanted to do. Um, and now we were forecasting every month and we had people to answer to. And it was just, it was such an amazing learning experience. And Match Group is phenomenal at acquisitions. They did a really, really good job of integrating us into the fold. Um, but that moment of Marcus walking into the restaurant and saying, I'm selling the company, I will never forget that. Um, I think for me, I mean, the one thing I, I did right is I co-founded the business um, in 2002. Uh, I had 55% of the company, and my co-founder had 45% of the company. Uh, when I started selling off chunks of the business, it took about 17 months to sell all of it. Um, at the first meeting with the private equity company, they, they asked us what our cap table was. And after 13 years, I could say, well, I own 55% of the company, and he owns 45% of the company. Uh, so start writing the checks. So it was, it was, I didn't have 10%, I didn't have 5%, I hadn't diluted myself with all this investment and all that kind of stuff. I didn't have other people telling me what to do and running my business. Um, so uh, the one thing I think I, I, you know, I, 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 got, I lucked into is I held on to my equity. And that's one of the things that I encourage you all to think about deeply. Uh, when you're thinking about whether you want to raise money to get some really cool furniture versus living on Ikea stuff, is that, that that equity that you give away along the way when you're growing your business is incredibly expensive when at the end someone's bought your business and they're writing checks and you realize how much you left on the table along the way because you sold off chunks of your business for a great discount on what you ended up selling the business for. So um, that's my last thing to end with. All right, so you've shared so much. I want to give you an opportunity to uh, to share anything with the audience, any asks. So I know that UpHabit is launching imminently. How can somebody learn more about UpHabit? And uh, Kim, you're next. Well, I, I, <laughs> I just started getting active on Twitter this morning. Um, so just you know, download UpHabit, try it out, tell us all the stuff that sucks, because we, we don't want to hear about the stuff that, that's working, because there's not, there's, not, not that there's not a lot of it, but there, uh, we want to make the product better. Um, my point on being here in Vancouver and flying across the country um, is that um, I want to give back to the community. So if anybody reaches out to me, it's just neil at uphabit.com. You should be able to figure that out email out. Um, you reach out to me, I'll reply. You'll have my calendar link in, the, in my signature, and you can book time with me and talk about anything that's going on. I like talking about product. I'm an engineer. I like geeking out on that stuff. I, li I like talking about scaling issues. Um, you know, you got problems with your co-founder. Anything you want to talk about, I've, I've lived through a lot of it. Um, 
and I'm happy to give anything back that you want from me, um, and that's why I'm here. So uh, rather than up have it, it's, it's really reach out to me and I'll, I'll be happy to engage with you in whatever fashion you want. And I'm not expecting anything in return. I'll, I'll definitely second that. Um, but one thing I do want to impart upon everyone here is to enjoy the ride. Um, everyone here, ever, at least my history, is you try so hard to grow so quick that you forget to take a step back and enjoy where you're at in that moment. My, some of my favorite times were when we were 10 people. And we were sitting around and we'd have blue glasses on the table because we could hide that there was wine in them instead of water. Um, and it was just, those moments are really special and you'll never get them back because you quickly grow and you quickly forget and the companies change. So just enjoy where you're at and the moments you're at because you'll, a year from now, it'll be very different. All right, let's give it up for Kim and Neil. And <laughs> Pindy's got a mic. Pindy's got two mics. I don't need a mic. Oh, keep a mic. I'm sure you've got stuff to add. Um, if there's any questions, we're going to take the top three to five. So put your hand up. Are we going to be one of those awkward audiences and have no questions? Oh, we aren't. Yaki's, is it Yaki? Yeek, Yoki is going to take the lead. Here you go, Yoki. So Kim, you talked about key metrics way in the beginning of your presentation. I just wanted to know how you decided on which key metrics to use for measuring success or measuring how far your company has grown. It's, it's really different for every company, um, but you can't look too top of funnel. You have to look at something that is really engaging. Um, if, if it's B to, B to C or it's, how do you engage customers in like a two-sided marketplace and what's that metric? So for us, it's like messaging. How do you get people messaging? Um, because if they aren't messaging each other, they're not going on a date. Um, if you think about B2B, it's how do you um, ensure that they're engaging with the platform and engaging with the app, otherwise they're gonna churn. So every company is very different, but it can't be too top of funnel. It's not purchase, like yes, revenue is important, but it's really about what are the core things that are gonna keep people engaged and what are the metrics that measure that engagement. And did it take you a while to settle on that metric or did you just figure it out right away? Marcus already had it when I joined. Um, he's extremely, da extremely data orientated, um, but it, when you think about what success means for and what the product value is, that's ultimately what's going to drive you to determine what that metric is. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Okay. We're going to make our way over. Anything over here before I leave? There was, there oh, was a, Ash, you can wait. There was a book by uh, Eric <laughs> Ries called Lean Analytics. So if you read Lean Startup, Lean Analytics is the next book in his series. I haven't read it yet, but it's all about that key metric. So hopefully it's good because I just mentioned it. Yeah, I um, have a question about the equity. I know Marcus held onto all his equity and you said you held onto your equity. So just a feeling from the employee standpoint, how you felt about you know, Marcus holding onto all the equities. As, an, as a founder of myself, a company, it's a decision I've gone back and forth on a lot. So just love to know your feeling about that for you know, um, employee retention and just morale, yeah. The best model I've heard recently, if you can afford to do it, is to have a pool of equity, but you do, you do an audit every year, every couple of years, that tells you what your fair market value of your company is, and if an employee leaves that has equity, you buy it from them. So that you're not diluting, you don't have equity that's kind of out in the public that um, they're no longer working at the company. So it, you get that kind of cash out from whoever is leaving, they get a bit of something for the value that they've brought to the company, but they're not gonna get the ultimate exit if they don't stick around. I actually changed that with up habit where if I sell a company pre-revenue, pre-launch today, the employees get 10% of the proceeds. Um, and I, I changed that because of that. And I came up with an interesting mechanism for doing it that's actually not in a stock option plan. Um, and I was really pleased with it and then I realized I did it 17 years ago in a prior business but I just forgot about it. So, um, um, but anyways, I, I basically carve out uh, a big chunk of the, and it can go up to 15%. Uh, of the exit value goes to the employees and it's divided out based on their tenure at the company, based on their weighted in income earnings at the company during the time they were there. Okay, By the way, it also avoids all this minority shareholder stuff that Canadian companies have to go through. So I will still hold all of the equity, but they get the benefit of the exit. Great. 
great. Um, there was a hand up over here. Um, can you talk a bit about the acquisition process that you went through and was there anything uh, looking back at that that you would have preferred to do differently or uh, was there something that you wish you knew going into that that you know now? I can say it's, uh, if you haven't been through a due diligence, it's, it's a proctology exam, a urology exam, all at the same time. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very interesting. I, the very first one I went through was in 1999, and then I went through uh, the one a few years ago. Um, you have to basically, you know, they audit everything. Then you have to promise that anything they haven't found, you're responsible for. Um, and you have to be comfortable with that. I'm just letting you know, it's a, typically a very... Uh, intense, uncomfortable process, and it usually boils down to two or three issues that the lawyers say there's no chance they can close on. And then you get the parties involved that actually want to do the deal, which are the buyers and the sellers. You get on a phone call, and after 30 minutes, they said, well, I don't really care about that one. Do you care about this one? They're like, I don't really care about that one. And then you close. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a nerve-wracking experience to go through a closing um, and go through the due diligence. I've never had a failed due diligence, and I've sold a couple companies now, but that can happen too. Um, and you also have to be prepared that you're selling the company. Like when I sold control of my company in May 2016, and I'd been CEO for 14 and a half years, three, three weeks later they fired me. But they'd paid for the right to do that, so that's what they did. And my wife, um, when I told her, she said, great, you're going to the gym tomorrow. <laughs> because she knew that all of that stress and anxiety and all that pressure that f sits on founders' shoulders dissipated that moment. And she was very thrilled to have me back. I went to the gym the next day. I lost 30 pounds. You know, it was a, it was a transformative thing, but it wasn't a negative thing necessarily. So, um, but it is a crazy process when you go through selling a business. And those reps and warranties they make you sign, they make, you're so nervous when you're signing them because your, your, your neck's on the line if anything's wrong and they can get all your money back, but it just really never really happens. And then they, um, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting and nervous, nerve wracking experience. And all the lines in your face all of a sudden fill in and smooth out as soon as it's done. And you click refresh on the browser and you see your bank deposit, uh, bank balance all of a sudden change. So I did that too. I would say I've heard horror stories about acquisitions. Ours was pretty smooth. Um, the biggest piece of advice I got was figure out what you want to learn from it and focus on that because you're having a different company come in, there's gonna be culture changes, there's gonna be new processes, but it's an opportunity for you to take a learning experience and take the best bits from it and the worst bits from it and say, okay, well, this is I would do this again and I wouldn't do that again. Um, but it's a great opportunity. And the other thing in going through an acquisition is the executives made the decision to sell a business, the employees had no say in the matter and they have no, they never interviewed with the new company, never you know, thought they would join the new company. So you have to work really, really hard to have them feel comfortable with their, their, their new employers because they didn't have any choice in the matter and they feel very disconnected once they get the news. And usually if they keep the executives around that were part of the deal, as Kim was, then things are smooth. But you know, if that, that ever changes, then it's a bit of a challenge. Okay, was there any other questions on this side? Ash, you wanna make your way over? <laughs> My knee hurts. Did you have a question, Ash? Yeah. Okay. Any other? Communication is really tough. Um, that's probably the hardest thing about scaling is communication needs to change when you hit different levels of employees. Um, when you're small, it's really, really easy, and you very, very quickly become big and don't realize that communication's broken. Um, and it's really important to stay ahead of that. I, we definitely didn't do it right. Um, we definitely failed in many ways in terms of communicating to our employees. Um, so I wouldn't use us as an example, per se. But um, it was really about creating a culture to bring in international people. It was about creating a culture where they felt like they had friends and it felt like they had people they wanted to hang out with. Uh, we were very, we had just such a phenomenal culture and we really tried to create events and things where people were hanging out outside of work. We do happy hours on Friday, 4 p.m., open bar, everyone go and hang out, play card games, do whatever you wanna do. And that really brought a lot of camaraderie to the group and we do a whist annual trip to Whistler 
and you're hanging out with people outside of work. It's our Christmas party. You go for a weekend to Whistler. We started that when we were five people, and it's still going on today. Um, and that's a great way to spend two or three days outside of the office with your employees and your people that you work with and your peers. And it's just it's a phenomenal experience. I have some of the best memories from those trips. And you walk away going, I know something about you that I didn't know before. We had some fun together, and it's not in a work environment. Ditto. <laughs> so much. Um, we're still around for another half hour, I think, or so. Um, so first, a round of applause for everyone who spoke today. You guys were amazing.